during to see during the sixties, I was abroad. I was in France and Spain, and I, you know, I was I was out of I was out of the country from about 1962, 63, and I was coming and going. So I was only here in the, really in the summer. Sure. So I didn't think, but I was well in with some of the people who were in the local uh, committee, and there were a rake of people on it. There, were, there was on Dennis Tim and Dennis the Corner. There was a lot of local people and the parish priest. And um, they had a kind of got hold of the railway station. Now, how they got hold of the railway station, I'm not quite sure. But they had it with the idea that if there was something, an industry or something could be formed using the station, that's what they were going to do. And at the same time, the boatyard, over, not the boatyard, but the, the industrial school was also closed. And by about 1965, I was a member, I was with the Glen Arms in France, because that's I was doing my sailing and living over there. And I got the French interested in starting here. And they were very nervous about moving out of France to start another base out of France because it was another country. They didn't know much about the history of the base. A couple of them did, but an awful lot of them were totally ignorant about anything in Ireland. And I, I won't go into that now, but I mean, it was absolutely bizarre. And I, I managed to persuade a couple of them to come over here and I met them here and first of all we looked at the, at the, industrial. the, the industrial school I mean that was too big it was it was totally wrong and we looked at the hospital that was over here mm. and that was it was wrong too because it wasn't close enough to the wall and then we looked at the railway station and the idea of uh, Lagarde of Baltimore that was, yeah. that they thought this was great, you know, this was the kind of thing, because they had a little place up in Pampol, which are kind of had connections with the, with the railway as well, you know. Okay. And so eventually what came about was that the French said that they would come here, but I was insistent that the Glenons remain, remain 50% moche moche, half French, half Irish, because otherwise it wouldn't work. If one crowd if the, particularly the Irish thought that were being taken over, they didn't want to know about. And if the French, they didn't, the French people wanted to come here to meet Irish people as well too. So yeah. it was a mutual thing. So the whole thing had to be done. But it was agreed for the first few years that the French members would provide the instructors because we didn't have any instructors here. We had a handful of people who eventually qualified as instructors. But in the beginning, we didn't have any. And then it was agreed the French would supply everything nautical including the boats and all, and the boats were sailed over from France, the four musketeers were sailed over from France, and also all the equipment. We started up, so it was agreed anyway, the French would supply everything nautical, the boats, the equipment and everything like this, and Fault Ireland, Board Fault at that time, would supply, uh, would, uh, supply the building, the railway station, and I got the job of putting all that into operation. So. Uh, Fault Ireland said they do up, or Board Fault said they would do up the building. So I, they got in a builders, uh, Catalans from Dunnanway, the builders, the English builders, until they are now, biggest builders in um, Dunnanway, and uh, they were obviously well in with Board Fault, and they, they got the contract to do up the building. So the building had to be modified a little bit, mostly interior work, but parts of it were reslated and things, because the building had been burnt during the Civil War here. Right, so uh, it was agreed anyway. We'd have an opening date and everything. Uh, I think it was June nineteen sixty nine. So in sixty eight we started on the project, and uh, I was working at I don't use the word kind of full time, and I was only a volunteer, but I volunteered. So I was kind of the representative here of the Glenrons in Ireland, etc., etc. So it started then, and we had a big opening in June. I think I have the dates now in 1969 and we had uh, uh, Helen Vianney who was the founder of the Glenons. She was in the French resistance during the war and she was married to Philip Vianney and uh, he uh, had a newspaper uh, which was an underground newspaper during the, during the Second World War and he produced uh, clandestine newspapers and uh, uh, he also had a school for journalism after the war, but Helen, his wife, she was originally Russian, she, descendant. She was a Menshevik, and they came to France in the 20s after the Bolsheviks took over. And uh, 
she was brought up and she was a student in the Sorbonne uh, when the Second World War uh, started and uh, uh, she was in the resistance and uh, very much involved in the resistance and uh, also another man that was in the Glenhorns as well too who was very important was um, uh, oh, oh ta -ta 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 -ta, Francois Gomez and he was with the French, Free French Navy and he was in the Caribbean, I'm not sure it was Martinique or Guadeloupe, on a French warship and I think he ended up either in America or Canada, and I'm nearly sure it was America and he was a part of the Free French Navy that came back into France after the war and he worked full time for the Glenons in Paris, in the Pont de Glenon and Guy Louis Blériot uh, and uh, he, he worked there. That's how the railway station came into public. Yeah, that's how it came. Yeah, yeah, that's how it came into public. And they, Ford fought a got it, yeah. and they never let go, and that's how they still have it. Yeah. But uh, what always intrigued me was what documents existed for us, because I do know, and I know this from personal things myself, that when CIA gave up the railway, they wanted to get rid of all of their property as quickly as possible at rock bottom price and I mean for like th that time it was like a pound mm -hmm. this kind of thing because they didn't want the liability of insurance so anybody who had a bit of land on the railway along the railway line could more or less get it by just signing a paper the and giving over yeah. abandonment yeah. so that it wouldn't be CIEs anymore so if somebody fell on it or something like this and I suspect the same thing happened here but well, I never saw the Dr. Glenn but that here. kept the railway station oh yeah going oh, yeah. as a sailing oh yeah entity. it kept it going it was going for 40 and years. can you oh, see the connection between that foundation of Glen Anne's and the building of the boats and the sailing how that would be replicated well, I see today or tomorrow well, with the process plan. Well, the, what I do see that the, the similarities this and that is we'd be not only reviving, but we would be preserving boat building in Baltimore because of the boat yard just across the way, which is probably gone beyond repair now, etc, etc, etc. We'd be reviving that and we'd be preserving a building which, if a speculator got their hands on it, would probably knock it and just build blinking holiday houses on it. And there's enough holiday houses in Baltimore now. We don't, I don't think we need any more, unless I'm wrong and everybody else is right. I don't know. But I don't think there should be any holiday yeah. houses. And I think that building should be preserved. The history about all the Civil War and all is a bit complicated. But from what I gather, now this is only what I heard. One, I was talking to a man who was in business here in Baltimore, Dinny Salter. And he went off sometime in the 20s, I'm not quite sure when. And he told me one time sat in the bar that he went off and joined the British Navy. He said because he was very upset because there was some young fella shot in the square here in Baltimore. Now, I don't know whether he was wounded or what, but who he was, what he was, I don't know. But it went on then, and I never heard any more. So there was obviously a certain amount of tension or something going on. Now, whether that was around 1916, I'm not sure. And I don't know, and somebody else can be looking into that. But what I did find out was that the railway station here, during the Civil War, Baltimore was held by the Republicans, from what I can see. And they set fire to the Coast Guard station. But before it was actually burnt, Dennis Driscoll, Dennis Tim over there, who's the marine engineer, told me that his father and several other men in the Cove went up and rescued the breeches boy that was in the shed up there. Okay? And they took that out and they put it down in the little shed the boat uh, shed that's down beside where Fields House the is now, house. the Rocket House, which is North Rock, which that was a boat shed for yeah. the Coast Guard's boat. They, yeah. The Coast Guard's had a launch and they kept it there. But it was down, it was, in other words, it was saved from being burnt. Yeah, this is the whole rocket wagon. The wagon and all the coast And it yeah. was put in there. Now, they, they obviously saved it, they saw the value, but the whole Coast Guard station was burnt. And I remember it, in fact, I have a photograph of 
the Coast Guard station in the 40s with myself sitting in the cove and the Coast Guard station was in the background, mm -hmm. the, the, the ruined the building. Room, the ruined building. Yeah. And uh, the Coast Guard station was there. Now, when it was not, I couldn't put a date on it, but I, I was away, when I was away in school or something. Yeah. I, I suspect it was in the early 50s. I'm yeah. not sure. But was the burning of the railway station in retaliation? N no, I believe, and I'm not absolutely sure, I think there was a policy that time of the Republicans burning anything that could be of use to the free staters that were at that time. Right. In the, and the railway station was set on fire, and there is a recording which is in a book about the, in time, of, I think it's called In Time of Civil War, which we have a copy of, mm -hmm. which states the, the number of carriages that were burnt and mm -hmm. all, and the fact that the railway station building was burnt, and the station master's house was burnt, which was an integral part of the railway station. And the other building that we know here, that's close to here, uh, the other building was in fact, I was told, was the engineer's house, mm -hmm. not the station master's house. Now mm -hmm. a lot of people refer to it as the station master, but I believe in the in the echelons and the way everything was at that time that in fact the engineer was a higher job than the station master because he was like the driver of the Boeing plane that time, you know, because the, the train for so important to know how to drive a train. It was, it was a prestige job to have way back along anyway. And uh, so the main part of the building was burnt and also there was a platform out in front of the railway station that existed the time I was with the Glenons. And that was only removed sometime, I suppose it would have been in the 80s. Okay. And that platform had a shed on it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the goods shed. And that was burnt during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the tracks went all the way down to the pier. Mm -hmm. There was an extension of tracks down to the pier, to the North Pier. And the platform is still there, even though it's all concreted over now, but you can see the two levels of the pier. And I think there was a shed down there, but there's loads of photographs of where the train could go down mm -hmm. and the carriages could load the fish directly from the, the boats onto the train. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously the big sheds up there then, they were burnt. And the carriage, it was known, was it the lamp house or something, that was also burnt. And that was a part of the main railway station. That's why a lot of the brick on the building down there, it's not because of its age, it was because of the fire that the enamel on the brick is broken. And that's why that part over the big door at the main part, which was the waiting room, uh, it's all flaky, mm -hmm. that it was never properly repaired as it should have been. Mm -hmm. So that's, and when it came to the Civil War, I'm not sure, but it, the place was definitely held by the Republicans. And a story I heard, now whether it's true or false, was that there was some young fellow putting, put guarding the, nor the pier in Baltimore. And this boat came in, and there were soldiers on the boat, and there was some officer standing up in the bow of the boat, and he said to the young fellow, he said, he said uh, take a rope from us, and the young fellow took a rope, he didn't know who the soldiers were, even though he was supposed to be guarding the place, and the officer stepped off and said, thanks for keeping the rope, I'll take the gun off you now. And that was, that was it. So the, the, that it was, was a free state boat. A free state boat. Yeah. Boat full of free state boat. Yeah. Yeah. And that was as far as the war went in Baltimore. Now that was a story I was told, whether it's true or not, I don't know. Okay. My dreams for it is that in order to complete our dreams, one thing we have to do is we have to have constant flow of money coming into it. And that goes for any project like this. And what I would input, but my personal opinion is that we have to do it all have a little museum there which will be informative in its own way which we can uh, do lots of different exhibitions we can have a permanent exhibition but we can have lots of different ones we can have them on piracy we can have them on boat building we can have it on the O'Driscolls, we can have it on fishing there's lots of different aspects that we can do it and we can have a little section on the west cork railway particularly the part a modern railway i would envisage inside in the what we call a cafe, which every museum must have, and a little bookshop, and we would promote uh, nautical heritage in, for, in Ireland, because there's nowhere that's dedicated to doing that other than the museum in Dunleary, 
which is a little bit different and more we can, shipping. We can more shipping. And in this, we can actually have boats being built at night classes, etc., etc. And now with modern technology, we can film the building and we can let see uh, the progress of it and watch a little film of the work going on. In fact, they can go in and see the boats, even if it's only the keel. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be encouraging to get young people in buses from the schools in Ireland to come down to see what we're doing because this is probably the last part in the country where they're still actively building wooden boats and I mean actively because I know they're being built in other places but we still have professional shipwrights here who grew up in our apprenticeship learning to build wooden boats and it must be done within the next I hate to say it in the next 10 years, otherwise I think a lot of these trades are going to be lost. I would, I would contribute as my part for this project. A little railway that we'll have running around the room, and if there's a cafe just above the doorway, all the way around the room, of the train travelling from Skibbereen to Baltimore. Right. With the actual little engines exactly as, as close as we can to the real thing and we can have stops and underneath we can have photographs and some video that exists 8mm films that were taken of the train with in little screens at intervals to show various crossings and things where you see the train coming and people can go in there and when they're having their cup of coffee or whatever it is uh, they can see this going around. When we get the building and when we get set up I think we'll have to have a project going like they have in Roskilde up in Denmark where they have the Viking longboats and the people come and uh, they, they kind of a certain age group of course and uh, they fit them they give them a lecture they fit them out with life jackets and they get them to go out to row the Viking ships out around the harbour now that's subject to it being calm weather and they usually sail back with the Viking square sail we can do that here now we're not going to have them rowing back because the boats we have are sailed back but we could have small crews on them with some volunteer crew who know how to sail the traditional boats and we can charge the people a little and that's the means because we have one of the things for any project like this it's even like the Glenons one of the primary things is you have to make it pay and I hate to use that but if you don't have a regular income coming in for a project the project is going to fail so by doing this and taking people out and charging them a little bit, not much, you can have a little revenue come in to help to pay for the upkeep of the building and all the projects that we want to do in the future. And the station building will be preserved. Oh, the station will, of course. The station, and the will, station will be honoured. And honoured. And also we'll have a tiny... I hate to use the word hostel, but I think we'll have a little uh, section of the building down there where we'll be able to sleep. Uh, that can be all debated out, maybe 10 or 15 people, something like this. They can stay down there and they give a little bit of, again, they'll pay a little bit like a hostel, but they can stay there and maybe do some boat building and learn the trade of boat building. And we can run classes down there and we can get some of people like Liam and John Hagerty, people who are shipwrights down, and there's some others as well too, down to give classes in boat building, whether it be small little boats or big boats. The argument for closing it was purely economical. It wasn't making any money, so we'd close it. And they had a fella called um, Todd Andrews. Yes. And he was the minister at the time. And there was another man, I remember how I Children. remember this now. There was a man in England called Beecher or something, Beacon or Beecher or something. And I remember we said the two laxatives. Because it was Andrews liver salts, which was a laxative of medicine. And there was a fellow called Beecher, I think, in England. And there was a thing in England called Beecher's powder or something. And I remember uh, as a young fellow, we used to talk about this because um, uh, this was the, the two guys that were going to hatch it and kill the railway. But what they say what happened, the big thing that happened was a delegation went up from West Cork to meet the minister. And when they went in to see the minister, the minister asked them, how were they? And, uh, did they have a nice trip up? And how did they come up? And they said they drove up. 
And the minister said, you've answered my question. You were you didn't use the way back. Only big goods that were brought was logs of timber were brought down to here to Baltimore for the boat yard. And they were offloaded. And there were an awful lot, of, I, I'm not sure of the, what happened, but some of them were left lying out on the side of the line down near the crossroads here. And more of them were offloaded in the crane that brought them straight in to the boat yard for building the boats. And at some stage, I can't remember when, but the engine shed with the turntable on it was used as um, uh, where that shed was, that was used as a saw, and there was a big saw, what they call a band saw, for cutting the logs up, and so that was up there, and the logs then were taken down into the into the air. But it was mostly, from what I remember, it was mostly logs and things like that, uh, stuff like that. And the, the I, I distinctly remember they wouldn't let me bring my little rudders and things because I used to, when I used to come down here, I had a little boat on the pier here. And it was a little twelve foot dinghy, a small dinghy. And I used to they wouldn't let me bring the rudder. Because I used to bring the rudder home because you know those things were hard to come by that time. And uh, I used to bring the rudder sometimes home or if I was varnishing or doing something. And they wouldn't let me bring anything to do with the boat into the passenger carriage, even though they'd be the only you know, there might be a half a dozen passengers on yeah. the train. Uh, I had to put it into the goods wagon. That was part of railway railway regulations. And I remember coming down from Skibreen to this day, I can remember seeing inside in the big wagons, all this was in it was cartons, big boxes of cartons of cigarettes for Dinny Salter, for the pub. He was the main. I know the other, there was a couple of shops here. There was Mrs. Harrington's over the road and there was Dennis de Corn. But for some reason, Dinny Salter, maybe he was distributing to the others, I don't know. But there was always cigarettes for Dinny Salter. And, uh, and know, would you put the rudder into the car? Oh, yeah, carriage? you had to. You had to. <laughs> That's yeah. a part of it. And I think there was, a, there was probably an extra charge for that sixpence. Or I don't know what there was, but I, I remember having to put my stuff in there. They wouldn't let me, even though it was small, they wouldn't let me bring it into the carriage. I took it for granted, you know. I never thought this is all going to end. You know, you, you didn't think of that. The train was there and when they did say that the train was going to end, then it came as a shock to everybody. Nobody believed this could happen, you know. And uh, train closing. And that's when everybody started taking an interest in it. Before that, people, the train was there, but they weren't, they weren't using it. And I believe the reason they weren't using it was it didn't tie in. CIE had their own schedule. And every train that they ran had to run to meet up with whatever trains they had. It wasn't for the use of the local people. You know, it didn't, you know, I don't know about the schedule, but it didn't work out. People weren't using it, and I think that was the reason. And also, of course, you had the bus starting to come down as well. Too. The bus is coming. But the buses, I don't think, were such a big issue to Baltimore. But certainly, the Skull Tram, had it been kept going, it would be a world heritage piece of equipment now because... Uh, it's so unique. It was absolutely magical. It was beautiful. It was absolutely. It was the most beautiful thing, and to see it out around Holly Hill and all, it was lovely. Now it was very slow, and it had all sorts of problems with it. And that time they were using bits of timber and uh, turf, and that didn't put enough steam into it, and it was very slow. And I, I mean, I remember going out there with my parents out to Skull and it was very very slow and I'm not saying I was bored but I kind of you know when do we get there <laughs> when are we going to arrive you know it was exceptionally slow but there was a lot the carriages were beautiful there were absolutely there were a couple of the kind of I think it was first second and third I can't remember that but there was something like that but it was the big cow pusher on the front of it and that was that was lovely and it had a big bell and a big chimney stack on it it was lovely lovely and as I said, it travelled along the side of the road and it even went, just to tell you how narrow it was, where the old cemetery is in Skibbereen, it was outside of the wall of the old cemetery. So that will tell you how narrow the road was then. So you'd want to take the width of the tram off of the wall of the old cemetery in Skibbereen and that narrowed down the existing road now, which was even less, you know. So the, and it went all along the road right out as far 
has um, where um, you know where the, the crooked uh, bridge you know the place yeah. there now with Newcourt yeah. where there was a lovely archway yeah. because that was a toll road there the people who had that house operated a toll there because they built that road and the road ran, the railway ran alongside that road. Now the, the railway would have been built after the road. And the people who had that house were the same people whose descendants was a minister in Timonique and he wrote the book called Heather Harp. And I'm trying to think of his name now, but I could fill you in with that afterwards. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, the train went all along the side of the existing road, all the way out as far as the Church of Ireland out there in, what's the first place there on the way out the back? Kilco. No, 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 before Kilco, uh, out where the, the shop was out there. You, oh, Church Cross. Church, mm -hmm. yeah, just before. Uh, you call it, yeah, no, before Church Cross, on this side, yes. where the Church of Ireland churches. On the Valley of the Arbor. Yeah, just there. Yeah. And it ran along there and then it went along by was it Holly Hill? Holly Hill. Holly Hill. And there was a little station there. And then yeah. it went down then and there was where the uh, I think they used to call it the Crooked Bridge. There was another bridge yeah. off the road yeah. and there was a watering place there with a water tower. Right. And that was there for a long time. Big wooden yeah. tower with a, a yeah. tank on top of it, yeah. and then it went all the way, kind of a little bit along until it got to Valley Harbour, down to the lovely region Valley Harbour, and then on to Scone again. And it was alongside oh. a bit of the road there. Yeah. 